Hello again, I'm Gary Stearman. Welcome to another edition of Prophecy in the News. Today we have a very special guest, author and lecturer, publisher by the way, Tom Horn, and we're going to talk about the uh, three volume set of books that he has to offer. It's phenomenal. You'll want this for your own library. Well, Tom Horn, welcome again to Prophecy in the News. Always good to have you back. Hey, Gary, always great to be here with you. And you have brought uh, that we're going to. Uh, you have brought three rather heavy volumes that we're going to share with our audience today. Uh, volume one: The Researcher's Library of Ancient Texts. And uh, I have three volumes. I would hold those up, except I'm not sure I, <laughs> <laughs> I can hold them all uh, because they are substantial. And by the way, printed on good stock that will last uh, as you use them and you will want to use them. How did you uh, come to put together uh, this three volume library, the researcher's library? <laughs> Yeah, it is quite a story, and and I we joke about buying those by the pound right now because they are so large. In fact, the last one, the Septuagint, the third volume, is 832 pages, and it's in that giant 8 and 11 by binding. But anyway, the question, you know, why would I have got involved in putting back into print these ancient sources? Well, of course, as you know, Gary, uh, almost two years ago now, in fact, January will be two years when the farmhouse that Nita and I had bought in Missouri burned to the ground. And everything in it burned up with it. We wound up with about a wheelbarrow load of stuff left over. Uh, but among the things that burned up in that house was my library. Wow. And now, Gary, I've seen your library, and I know you're a lot the same way I am in that over a long period of time, you know, you pick, you choose, you refine down. And over decades, you acquire a library that took you decades to build. And that's what I had. In fact, one of the books that burned up in that library, one volume, the insurance company uh, appraised at $18,000 for mm. just one of, this, of these books. So I lost quite a bit. But then what happened was, um, not long after, we were in a temporary house, uh, and I was doing a writing project. And while I was writing on this project, I went to check something. I went to grab one of my books, right? And mm -hmm. it dawned on me, I don't have them anymore. And immediately, I just felt like I was crippled, like I couldn't wow. do serious research any longer. And so what happened was I decided to start gathering those books again, books that I need, books that are now in these volumes. And that's when it dawned on me that if I needed these books that much to check historical facts or cultural issues, uh, or whatever, while doing serious research, <coughs> how many more people would also yeah. benefit from having trustworthy versions of those books? Now, we're going to be talking about these volumes one at a time. The first volume, uh, which uh, uh, starts with the Book of Enoch, also includes the Book of Jasher, the Book of Jubilees, and the Apocrypha, which was for a long time included as part of the King James Bible. And to me, the value of these is their historical value. They are all historical texts. Enoch, for example, was used, we know, in the first century during the days of Jesus. They regarded that as a reliable history. Right. Uh, again, the book of Jasher, book of Jubilees, uh, again, they, were, they were regarded at a certain point as reliable history, and they, they are still of great value. Uh, let's talk about the, the book of Enoch to begin with. And you have the entire... Uh, Book of Enoch as the first part of volume one. What is the value of the Book of Enoch? Well, you know, you said something a moment ago that I think is really important, and that is they considered it to be valuable history. Mm -hmm. And this goes to the point that if it's not included in the canon uh, right. today. Uh, there were some in the early church who did consider it to be scripture. We can talk about some of them later, if you like. There were others that just considered it to be of historical value, and that's the way that I have approached this in publishing these books. Uh, I would want people to know that I'm not placing these on a par with the Bible. I'm not saying that right. they are divinely inspired, but I, what we are saying is that they are useful resources that can fill in the gaps in history, much in the same way that um, students uh, in university right now that might be seeking a degree in divinity 
these books are often required. Furthermore, they're often very expensive. Yes. Uh, you know, volume one alone has 17 books in it. That's why we had to put it in such a large binder. If you were to buy all of these books one at a time, it would cost hundreds of dollars. And uh, so we wanted to make them available, including, get, to get back to your question, the book of Enoch. Hey, uh, do you know that what's always struck me about the book of Enoch? You open it up, and the first thing that it talks about is the tribulation period and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as plain as day. The behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Well, we read about that in Revelation 19. And that's quoted by, by Jude, uh, the book uh, in your Bible just before Revelation. And Jude is talking about the correlation between ancient history and the second coming of Christ. And that's the interest that I have in the book of Enoch. It, it really draws correlations between the ancient days and days that are still future to us, all in the same book, which is amazing. Right. Now, if somebody's watching this show and they're, maybe they're a young Christian, they're not even familiar with the book of Enoch, and therefore why would they care about it or why should it be important? Uh, the book of Enoch is an ancient text. Um, it was written in the days of Jared. And we know then, based on the Bible, that the days of Jared, Jared was the father of Enoch. Enoch was the uh, great-grandson of Adam and the great-grandfather of Noah, to put it into perspective. And what scholars tell us is that the book of Enoch was written while Adam, get this, while Adam of the book of Genesis was still alive. So while the first man from the six days of creation was still alive, walking on the earth, he was about 450 years of age as I understand it. This is the time period in which the book of Enoch was written. And the story that the book of Enoch tells is central to understanding, some people believe it's really central to even understanding the Old Testament. That if you don't understand the story of these very powerful angels, this is the story it tells, called Watchers. They were part of a very specialized group of angels in heaven, very powerful angels, who evidently even participated with God in creation, played some role. 200 of them decide that they're going to rebel. They're going to leave their place of habitation, the place that's been fixed for them. And this, this book starts out saying that it was in the days of Jared, Enoch's father, where they came down onto Mount Hermon, came down into the Valley of the Plains. And what did they do? Well, this is where an awful lot of Greek myth and other things actually grew out of what was probably originally a true story. These powerful angels took women. And they either married them and raped them and had daughters and sons by them, or to think of it in more modern terminology, which we can talk about later today, uh, they used their genetic material. And uh, at the end of the day, what they did was they created a mutated form of man into which they extended themselves. And somehow that allowed them to leave their fixed place in heaven and to enter into our reality. Uh, and of course, ultimately, this wound up being judged by God. Now, these were the days of Noah, of course. And the reason this is becoming so important today is, is because of the prophecy in the New Testament, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, if we live in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, which we believe we do, uh, we're going to see a recurrence of what Enoch writes about. And as a matter of fact, looking at Jude in my own Bible, Jude 6 says, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. And then Jude goes on to quote uh, chapter 1 of Enoch, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So he's basically correlating two ideas there that go all the way back to Genesis 6. And it's very valuable to read about this. Yeah, and that story the, and the book of Enoch were for 700 years at least following the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was read in churches. It was considered to be good history and by some considered to actually be scripture, quoted as scripture by some of the early church fathers that we'll talk about later in volume two mm -hmm. in this series. They considered it to be sacred. But uh, in any case, that story was told. Well, what happened? Here's what happened to the book of Enoch. Uh, it basically fell into political disfavor. 
uh, the church was becoming more and more sophisticated, you know, and they were moving towards the Enlightenment era and yeah. rationalism. Actually, some of the very things that the early church fathers considered to be heresy and were fighting against, Gnosticism and secret societies and all of that, right? It seems like the devil always has some game plan to come in and corrupt the truth. And so here you have a Bible. The Ethiopic church believes that the book of Enoch was actually uh, preserved by Noah, was, was kept on the ark, and that was how it was preserved through history and wasn't washed away in the flood. And, uh, uh, and then it disappeared from history. It fell into political disfavor. Uh, the church was embarrassed by this idea that angels could get married to women and have unusual <laughs> offspring called yeah. the giants. You know, it's just it, it kind of like today, right? Some of our sacred theology today, the liberals are opposed to it. They don't want to think of Jesus as being the God man or divine. They mock prophecy. They, they think, you know, that p people like us might be out on a limb. Well, that's what happened. And little by little, the book of Enoch disappeared from the pages of history. And then the second side of that story, of course, is in the 1700s, uh, three manuscripts of the book of Enoch were found in Ethiopia, taken to Europe, translated into the various European languages, including English. And uh, so today, we're making available to people a book. I think of how this connects you in time and distance. It's a, you know, almost a quantum physics type yes. question. That you can hold in your hand a book the words of which were written when Adam was still walking upon the earth, and you can read that record and imagine how God had preserved it. Now, Enoch walked with God, and he was basically transformed. He was metamorphosed into a glorified being, and God took him to heaven. He didn't die. But you know, when you read about the book of Enoch, Enoch took an amazing journey, and then he came back and recorded what he saw. And what he saw was the future of mankind. Uh, all the way through the tribulation and the new heavens and the new earth, I mean, he saw it all. And gives you a perspective, by the way, that you're not going to get any other way. Well, I wish we had time to talk about more in the book of Enoch, but the second thing you have here in your uh, researcher series is the book of Jasher. Uh, now, the book of Jasher is mentioned uh, in Scripture, and, you know, the book of Jasher gives us uh, some uh, backstory uh, subplots uh, that fill in a few of the details that the Torah, the first five books of Moses, don't have. That is, they, God saw fit to leave out some of the details, but in the book of Jasher, we, we find the backstory, for example, the life of Abraham, the patriarchs. There are some amazing historical details in that book. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that stood out to me probably as most significant due to my interest, as you know, in transhumanism, mm -hmm. and is there anything <laughs> prophetic about yeah. where we're at in the genetics revolution today, is it actually a repeat of what Enoch and Jasher and Jubilees the story that they record, which uh, are, are all three of those books, by the way, are included in volume one. The story that they tell, they tell from different points of view, different perspectives. So Enoch focuses on one aspect of the story. Jubilees tells us more about the angels themselves, but includes information about their interest in genetics, how they wanted to transform basically the composite makeup of the Adam man, the Amon man, the man of, of red clay. And then Jasher, when I was doing research into this field, Jasher records a verse that Gary, I think, is probably the most ancient reference to a high-level form of biotechnology. How did they take genetics from women and animals and merge it and create this body? And what Jasher says in Jasher 4.18 is after the angels had revealed the secrets of heaven mm -hmm. to man, these are secrets of creation. After they did that, Jasher says, then men begin to blend animals, one species with another species, and this provoked the Lord. And Jasher unequivocally states that that is what led to the great judgment of the flood and the need to, uh, to eliminate from earth the contamination of flesh. But if you were to take yeah. that verse 
and give it to a modern scientist or a geneticist and say, what is being described here, they would say it's transgenics. Absolutely. The taking of the genetics of one species, blending it with the genetics of another species is something we're doing in laboratories all around the world Which, today. And that's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, uh, hybridization uh, of seeds, of animals, of fish, uh, genetic mutations of all kinds. Tom, you know as well as I do, you've written about the subject. You're an expert in the, in the field uh, of transgenics. It's going on uh, with increasing, increasing force to the point that some people are saying it's going to be impossible one day to tell what's, what's a hybrid and what's not. Well, actually, experts are already saying that we have already entered into what they're calling the hybrid age. Now, what they mean by that is we had the post-industrial age, we had the industrial age. These are moments in time, periods in time, where a technology advances to a point that it becomes practical, it becomes applicable. Uh, then we had, by the way, the information age, which gave birth to the internet. And now, uh, anybody watching this show, go mm -hmm. to Google, type in the hybrid age, and look at the, the, the peer-reviewed articles that are being published right now. Peer-reviewed. So, Peer-reviewed. This is not weekly world news. And Ooh. as a matter of fact, last week, uh, the Academy of Medical Sciences uh, out of Britain, uh, the, the, they work with the oldest uh, academic scientific body in the world, 350 years old. And they published a white paper just last week talking about the dangers of human enhancement. But if you read the article, they're not saying uh, we should avoid this. What they're saying is it's here, it's already started, there's no stopping it. And the danger is going to be trying to build some kind of control grid around it. Otherwise, here's what they say in their report, otherwise there is going to be a super form of human race that is going to dominate the naturals. And the naturals are going to become a slave race. So, but this is coming to us. Of course, God's not going to allow that to happen. Well, God's not going to allow it to happen, but look at it as a sign of the times because this is exactly what happened in the days of Noah. Amen. We will create a superior yeah. race of man that will make a slave race out of the others. And God said, And We're that's, done. by the way, why it's valuable to read the ancient texts. It gives you a, a fuller view of man's history. Uh, we are, uh, the clock is rolling by. I, I wish we had days and days to talk, but I want, let's talk about volume two. Now, volume two of the Researcher's Library of Ancient Texts, which I'm holding here, has uh, the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, Clement of Rome, the, uh, the first epistle of Clement to the Cor Corinthians, Methetes, Polycarp. Uh, uh, we have here uh, the encyclical epistle uh, uh, to the Philippians. Uh, we, we just have all kinds of very valuable texts in here. Clement of Rome. Uh, a, a man very close to the Apostle Paul. You read the things written by Clement and suddenly you get a real view of what life was like in the first and second centuries. You're talking about real people writing about real events and real things here. Right. And these, um, the early church fathers, these are the earliest church fathers before some of the heresies set on later down yeah. uh, the line and uh, Romanism came in. These, are, these were, uh, for the most part, disciples of the apostles of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, Clement was a close personal friend of yes. the Apostle Paul. Uh, by the way, Clement believed that the book of Enoch was inspired scripture. And when you read his book in volume two, right. you'll see him quoting from the book of uh, Enoch. But he was an apologist, a brilliant man, became the Bishop of Rome, as I recall. Yes. And uh, yeah. uh, so, so important, I think, is his work when you read it, because it places into historical context the kind of challenges that the church, after the death of the uh, Apostolic Fathers, the kind of things that they were dealing with. Now, we just barely have time to touch on this volume, too, but I want to read some of the words of Clement here, just to give you a flavor. He writes, uh, in his first epistle, epistle to the Corinthians, ye foolish ones, compare yourselves to a tree. So take, for example, the vine. First of all, it sheds its leaves, and then it buds, and then it puts forth leaves, and then it flowers. And after that comes the sour grape, and then the, the ripened fruit. Ye perceive how in 
a little time the fruit tree comes to its maturity. And he's talking here about a grapevine or a tree. Of a truth soon and suddenly shall his will be accomplished, as the scripture also bears witness, saying, Speedily he will come and will not tarry. And the Lord shall suddenly come to his temple, even the Holy One for whom you look. And if you read this in the full context, Tom, it is Clement encouraging people to keep looking for Christ. Because at the time he was writing, the apostles had all passed away. <clears throat> Jesus had not come. People were getting discouraged. They were starting to turn away. And he says, no, you foolish ones, keep watching. As we say here at Prophecy in the News, keep looking up. And, and, it, and I understand. I feel this in my heart. It's, it's a very difficult thing to keep looking up. You get discouraged. Right. Well, he was, he was one of the masters of Christology. Uh, yes. he, he wrote some of the most important early doctrine on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But the emphasis that you're reading right now, you know, how long have we known how important the imminency of the coming of Jesus Christ, the doctrine around that, how long have we known how important that is for uh, the, the very integrity of the church itself to stay focused on the coming of Jesus Christ. And when you lose that perspective, what happens? You start becoming caught up in the cares of the world. You become worldly. Sure. You may even fall out of, uh, of church. You know, you're no longer a part of fellowship. All that can kind of happen because you lose your focus. And this is what Clement is saying. You know, th there are martyrs. There are people who are dying for their faith. And there's others who are secularists, heretics, that are perverting. They're saying, where, where is the coming of Christ? Well, that's prophetic too. It is. And, uh, and so how important well, it is, Cl Clement basically would have fit right in with prophecy in the news oh, because sure. he would have ended every sermon with saying, keep looking keep up. Looking up. <laughs> and, and you have just a brief sample of what it's like to read the letters and the teachings of the Apostolic Fathers. And that's volume two uh, of this wonderful work that has been made available to you by Tom Horn. And Tom, uh, the, again, uh, to beat the clock, Let's go to Volume 3. The Researcher's Library of Ancient Texts, Volume 3, is the Septuagint. What is the Septuagint? Well, the Septuagint was the version of the Bible that these early church fathers read and that the apostles read. As a matter of fact, we know, uh, I, th I think you were telling me that Hebrews was probably somehow based on uh, the kind of language that was being used. At the time that the Septu uh, at the time that the disciples would have been reading the Septuagint. Yeah, in fact, it's interesting when you read Old Testament Bible quotes that have been written in uh, included in the Book of Hebrews, they uh, virtually always come from the Septuagint, because that was what was being read uh, in the first century. And and it, when you get right down to cases, if you wanted to make people understand what you were saying, you would quote material they were used to. Right. In other words, to say it maybe a, a little more articulate, uh, 300 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, the average Jew didn't speak Hebrew anymore. Right. Uh, and they wanted a Bible that was in their language. The Hebrew Old Testament was their Bible, but except for their rabbis, it mostly had just become a poetic language, right? It's kind of like priests today reading out of Latin. It's more of a po yeah. poetic thing. And, and what, happened, what happened was they, they got the attention of the Greek king of Egypt, uh, a man by the name of Ptolemy II, who agreed, and he assembled, this is another, by the way, another show for another time, but he assembled 72 Hebrew scholars. There's a lot of importance around that number because of their belief about the 72 cosmocrators that had control over the populations of the world. But in any case, they assembled 72 Hebrew scholars, they came to Alexandria, they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Koine Greek so that the average Jew would be able to read it. Also made it to be included in that great uh, library there in uh, Alexandria, which of course later on burned to the ground. But for, for, for about 300 years before Jesus, during the time of Jesus, and for hundreds of years following the time of Jesus, the Septuagint was the Bible. Uh, in the 1800s, it was translated into English, and yes. that's the version that we have published uh, in the third volume of the Researcher's Library. And that's what I wanted to add, but because we're, we're running out of precious time, it's readable. Uh, originally, uh, Koine Greek, most people don't read Koine Greek, but the English translation is just 
and I'm holding it, and I'm even looking at it, it's very readable. Uh, it is, uh, the English flows together, and you get this uh, translation of, again, it gives you a sort of a, a historical flow uh, and, and a way of looking at things in the days of the Jewish scholars uh, before the time of Christ and during the time of Christ. So it's a valuable thing to have, as are all three volumes. I'm going to, uh, to hold up volume one here. Uh, because if I held up all three, I don't think I could talk. <laughs> I'd have to take a deep breath. Uh, each of these volumes, and they are called the Researcher's Library of Ancient Texts, Volume 1, 2, and 3, each of them is available to you uh, uh, for $29.95 plus shipping and handling. So you can order them one at a time. You can order all three volumes of the uh, ancient, uh, the researcher's library of ancient texts, and we're going to make you a very special offer. Uh, when you order these, ask for Enoch and the Ancients package. Enoch and the Ancients. And not only will you, will you receive the three volumes uh, at uh, a very low price of $89.95, but we will include absolutely free this five-hour, four-DVD study of the Book of Enoch done a while back by J.R. Church and myself. And so you get the three volumes plus the DVDs, total package, $89.95. Uh, this just being a bonus uh, for your interest at this time. And I think you'll have a wealth of study. Tom, we're down to about a minute left. And uh, what would you like to leave people with today? There, There is... This is a time of intellectual challenge for Christians. Things are popping. It's an age of ideas. It's an age when Bible prophecy is really coming to a higher understanding, I think, than it ever has before. Things are moving rapidly. Uh, if, if you don't keep up, so you'll wake up one day and say, wow, I, I, I had no idea that this was being taught. Uh, and you're right in the, in the forefront of the battle trying to keep people informed, right? Absolutely right. And it's time for some people to rediscover these ancient works because they're more relevant now than ever before. We didn't have time in this show to talk about the numerous issues that they deal with that are really today's headlines. What's happening in Egypt? What's yes. happening in Iran, Iraq? They actually prophesy uh, how these could be triggers for Armageddon. So there's a great deal of, of important material. It's also an opportunity for those that have never read these works to discover them for the first time. And that's why we published them at an affordable price so that a person can get the, this whole collection of a couple of dozen ancient books that were the mm -hmm. most important to me and I believe will be to them too. And now you have them back in your library. I do. Your new library, <laughs> which is growing, by the way. Tom Horn, God bless you. Thanks for being with us today. It's always fun talking with you. Thank you. Gary. And by the way, he's a wealth of information. Gary Stearman, keep looking up, everybody. He's coming soon. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.